All right, my next guest is an actor, an author. He's appeared in TV shows uh, from House, CSI, Criminal Minds, uh, Rizzoli and Owls, Ally McBeal, movies such as To Live and Die in L.A., Cutting Edge, uh, Red Dragon, Gettysburg, and another one uh, you might have heard of called Field of Dreams. He's the author of the book, If You Build It, uh, a book about fathering faith and Field of Dreams. Uh, I'm honored and privileged to have on uh, actor uh, Mr. Dwyer Brown. Thank you for joining Sports Car Nation today. My pleasure, John. Good to be here. All right. So, I mean, first thing, you know, obviously, uh, I, I know you grew up in a small town. I, I know you, it says you played sports. Uh, sports were important to you uh, as as a young man. Um, did you collect cards at all? Was card collecting a thing for you as as a younger man? Yeah, my brother and I had a little kind of shared card collection, which, you know, as, as if you have a brother, you know, that was always uh, kind of an interesting uh, feat. But yeah, yeah, we had we had some card collections back in the day when, you know, you could cut them out of the back of cereal boxes. And, uh, you know, we had a few official ones. But yeah, we were we lived pretty far out in the middle of nowhere. So there wasn't as too many places you could get cards, you know, but uh yeah, we had we had quite a little collection. In fact, I, I should hit my brother up uh, where that stuff is now. It could be worth millions. Yeah, yeah. You never know, depending on on, on what it is. I'm gonna uh, draw a little parallel between you and Michael Jordan, if if I can try here. Oh boy, uh, I read that you were, <laughs> I read that you were cut from your freshman <laughs> baseball team. And if if anyone knows, you know, Michael Jordan was cut from his uh, freshman basketball team. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say you both went on to probably, you know, with all due respect to, to uh, people on the team, to have pretty good careers in, in your own uh, respect. So there's my there's my uh, correlation. Uh, Thank you. I, I guess you're saying I'm the greatest of all time for six minute roles in baseball movies. Maybe. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I uh, I the the only uh, uh, revenge I had on that is. Uh, you know, my I went to the Baseball Hall of Fame, and, and of course, my picture is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. So for all those guys who made the team my freshman year of uh, high school baseball, it's my picture that's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. Tell them, hey, I made the Baseball Hall of Fame. Maybe, uh, maybe I, not on the plaque, yeah. but I'm in there. I went in the back door, but there, there I am. <laughs> yeah, and that that's uh, that's awesome, and it, it's true. You know, we can laugh at it tongue in cheek, but at the end of the day, it still still rings true, and. Uh, uh, that's pretty cool. I'm in I'm in Syracuse, uh, which is really only an hour and ten minutes from the hall. I'm usually there three or four times a year. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful place, as I'm sure you know. And uh, oh, yeah, and, yeah, and 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 you're and like you said, you're you're in it. So that's uh, that's even cooler. Um, you know, I, I'm going to get more specifics uh, in into the movie. Um, you know, here at the, uh, on the second half, but uh, you know, obviously the movies led to different opportunities. Um, you, I, I read that you recently bought uh, in property in Dyersville, Iowa. Just kind of uh, talk a little bit about that and and some of the you know the background there. Well, uh, gosh, yeah, I have occasion to go to Dyersville, you know, several times a year, and and there's this gorgeous old building there, brick and, and, and limestone. I found out it was from 1860, which I thought was interesting because that's sort of when baseball kind of became popularized in this country. And this building was kind of falling down. There was a hole in the roof for five years and it had just been raining and snowing. And anyway, I just kept seeing it. And it was a little bit like a Ray Kinsella voice moment where I'm, I just kept picturing a sign Kinsella's hanging from this place. And I thought, oh gosh, but you know, I live in California and I was so far away. And anyway, I kept seeing this, you know, it, it was on, it was for sale for years. And finally, I just, you know, I, I talked to a friend of mine and we ended up uh, buying this, this building and, um, you know, we've been fixing it up, you know, had to get the roof, roof patched up first. And, and uh, interestingly, we just got a 10 year lease with the, if you build it museum, which is, um, a museum they created about the making of the movie. And so they're uh, opening, I think uh, maybe uh, end of May. And, uh, and my partner and I have decided to create the baseball hall of dreams right next door, which will be a kind of a, a, an homage to players who maybe didn't have enough uh, credentials to get into the uh, hall of fame, but who, you know, contributed great things to baseball. And we're going to include, you know, stickball and, 
and and all forms of baseball over the years and you know fantastic stories and minorities in baseball, women's leagues, Negro leagues. Anyway, we're just putting it together. Literally, I'm leaving Tuesday to, uh, you know, kind of start setting up the exhibits. And uh, we're pretty excited about it, you know, because so many baseball fans, of course, come to uh, Dyersville every year. And, uh, you know, many more now that MLB is committed to doing uh, uh, 10 games over the next 15 years there. So anyway, we're, we're excited about it. We're get, we have a collection of a couple hundred uh, vintage baseball gloves much like the one my dad taught us to play catch with when I was growing up. So anyway, we're going to have a lot of cool stuff there, but that's the basic plans. And uh, we're going to, you know, try to get a restaurant. We're going to set up batting cages. Anyway, should be cool. Come see no, us. that's, that, that's exciting. I, I look forward to seeing, you know, the, your progress uh, with that. And, you know, you mentioned stick ball. I'm, I'm in Syracuse, but I'm originally from New York city. Oh, so yeah. uh, stick ball, uh, uh, I'm old enough even to still, remember that my dad was a big stickball player and uh uh it's it's it was good to hear that uh that term again there's some parts of the country may not be as familiar with it but i know uh in new york that was uh, a huge thing and uh it, it's nice you're creating something to you know recognize folks that uh maybe like you said didn't get into the the, the, the hall of fame uh but uh, you're going to you're going to acknowledge uh, their their uh, achievements and their contributions and uh, uh, just the same and and that's uh, you, you know that's just an awesome thing. No yeah, my way partner to wants to have a stickball game the day of the uh, the big uh, MLB game uh, August 11th uh, yeah. on the street in front of our place. So we'll save a yeah. place on the stoop for you, John. I, all right, I I, I I hope I can make it. I love to go. I've never been uh, been there yet, and uh, like you said. You know, uh, MLB has announced, uh, you know, the, the, the 10 games in 15 years. Uh, we saw last year's game, which was uh, tremendous. You didn't have to be a Yankee fan or a White Sox fan to appreciate uh, that game. You were you were privileged and fortunate enough uh, to be there. Sp speak about that. Like this movie has just, breathed, you know, continues to to expand into and a life of its own into uh, obviously real baseball with, with these major league games. And it's just cool. You get to sort of continue, you know what I mean? And, and be a part of these things. Talk about, you know, being there for, for last year's uh, game. Well, like you were, like, the, like you said, it, first of all, it was an amazing game and I, I, they hadn't given me a ticket. So I was going to be watching it in downtown Dyersville and, and finally, uh, somebody ponied up, but, uh, you know, I got great seats and what was kind of amazing about it was, well, first of all, it's, you know, 6,000 seats. So it's, you know, the Yankees in a kind of like a minor league kind of setting, the field, the, the, the stadium they built was incredible. It had old barn siding and they had the hand operated scoreboard and, and the corn was just amazing. Everybody you know, was like rooting for anybody to hit it into the corn. I mean, what, what a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, you know, venue this was for, for baseball. And like you said, here's the Yankees and the White Sox. I swear, anytime anybody got a hit, 75% of the crowd went crazy. You know, like everybody was rooting for everybody. You know, it was just one of those games that, that felt like it was a, it, we were cheering for baseball more than for the individual teams. And, and what a game, you know, back and forth and, 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 you know, home run after home run. And I, I don't know, it was, it was just, the most magical experience. And, uh, you know, and, and because of this movie, I end up getting experiences like that, which, which are, you know, fantastic. I've been to, you know, the TriStar show in Chicago for, you know, memorabilia. I've been to Batavia card show and, and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, I, I've just had, you know, just fantastic good luck meeting field of dreams fans and, you know, baseball fans all over the country, all over the country. Well, I'm glad you. I'm glad you went. I know you first said like you didn't have a ticket. Like that's uh, to me, that's a travesty. I hope that's uh, like uh, doesn't occur again. Uh, I mean, to me, that movie and you are synonymous. That scene when we're going to get into more specifics. That scene really, you know, even though it comes towards the end, uh, that that is the movie to me and uh, really set the the tone of what I think most people uh, think about the movie. That movie would be completely different if that scene uh wasn't in that that movie and uh uh you know we're gonna get into that but yeah i, I hope you're they, they, you're included in all that stuff as as you deserve to should be no there shouldn't even be a question well, uh, going forward 
from your mouth to God's ear, John. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you're well. I'm just you're well, welcome, but I'm I'm just being honest too. So maybe not God's ear, but MLB's ear, which is yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, uh, no doubt. And uh, you know, I, I I know you you know, in, in reading some of, of of what you wrote and stuff, you know, in your younger years, you, you know, you you had a little bit of a strained relationship uh, with your dad, which you you got to reconcile, uh, you know, before it was too late. And I know you spoke uh, as we get now more into the movie, you know. Uh, unfortunately, passed away about a month before shooting uh, on Field of Dreams began. Uh, fortunately, you got you were there and you got to spend uh, some time. And and you know, for me, you know, the movie came out in, in 1989. I was 17. I was playing high school baseball. Uh, I was raised by my grandparents, Dwyer, and uh, so my grandfather passed away five years before in 1984, and he was my and my I, my dad was in my life, but my grandfather was really who got me into baseball and practiced with me, played the catch and and all that stuff. And so it was you know it was it recent with him passing in five years. And then that movie just uh, I watch you know I don't know how many times I've seen the movie, uh, but uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, you know I even watched the scene this morning just to kind of get revved up and like a little baby tears rolling down my face in my office here by myself. And uh, it, it's, it, it doesn't matter how you know what's coming, you know, the lines, you know, the dialogue, but it just, it just hits that, that central nerve. Uh, and, and the beauty of, of that moment, it can mean so many different things to so many different people. For me, it, it like, it, it's my grand thinking of my grandfather for, it could be an uncle, it could be a mom, you know, it's, it's who, however you, interpret it internally but you know going back i'm rambling on here you know with with your own uh dad uh and, and you got to kind of be there and and you know unfortunately you have to say uh, goodbyes and then here you are you know 30 days later approximately and you're doing this scene i mean just kind of talk about all that sort of jump you know together like well yeah uh first of all i'm, I'm sure your grandfather and your your dad are really proud of uh, of who you've become. That's kind of exciting to think maybe they're watching Sports Card Nation from. Uh, yeah, from my Britain. dad. My dad's still with us. Oh, awesome. my dad's, he's eighty three. Oh, and, uh, and that's this is one of his. Uh, you know, I haven't. I, I got to call him later and tell him who I, I was. I spoke to you, but <laughs> it, he'll be uh, he'll be ecstatic. One of his favorite movies as well. But but go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well. Uh, you know, uh, of course, my my father's uh, passing was sudden and unexpected. I I'd been cast in the movie. Uh, it was called Shoeless Joe at the time, and uh, I was in L.A. and uh, so I was I I, I was going to fly back to Iowa to shoot, and I decided to come back a week early so I could hang out with my folks in in Ohio and uh, and then go shoot the movie. Well, uh, the day I got home. Uh, from LA to Ohio, my, my father died that night. He had uh, had some issues um, with, uh, gosh, well, he died of cirrhosis of the liver, even though he he wasn't a drinker at all. So mm -hmm. that was a, a mystery to all of us. But uh, so as an actor, you know, I, I'm, of course, heartbroken. My father died, but I, I was worried that, you know, when I got to shoot the movie, you know, 30 days later, that I wouldn't be able to keep my emotions together that I would just fall apart. You know, I, I'd auditioned for the part doing the role a certain way. And I was just worried that I, I wouldn't be able to get through the scene, you know? Um, so, so it created, it, 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 you know, created an interesting problem for me. As it turns out, um, I, I sort of had trouble uh, crying about my father's death. You know, at the funeral, I was like, when is this going to hit me? I, I had this overwhelming sense of joy and relief that my dad, who'd had a pretty rough life, he, he his dad was kind of very hard on him. He, of course, suffered through the Depression and World War II. And, and you know, I mean, he was a wonderful man, but, you know, didn't have a lot of the cards uh, in his favor. And so uh, somehow there was a sense of joy around him. And when I got to uh, Iowa, of course, there's supposed to be these ghost players and there's actual actors and extras playing them. And I sort of got the feeling that my dad was just amongst them somehow, you know, that he was just another kind of ghost player, which was just the most pleasant 
feeling for me. You know, I, 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 it felt like he was sort of this hummingbird that was like flying to Jupiter, checking it all out and then buzzing back and was like, Oh my gosh, Dwyer, you should see this thing. It's the universe is amazing. And off you go, you know? And uh, so that created another problem. I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm not going to be able to get emotional at all rather than, you know, completely not be able to hold myself together. But, uh, you know, we, the scene that we shot, uh, as it turns out, to, to make things even worse, um, this scene, which is only, you know, five minutes long, you'd ordinarily shoot it in a day or maybe two, they decided to shoot that last scene in Magic Hour, which is that 15 minutes of golden light just after the sun goes down, everything looks really beautiful and warm. And, well, you know, that's great, but that means this scene, you, we would only shoot it in these little chunks, you know, and, and if any of you work, ever worked on a movie, you know how slowly it moves. They'd be shooting in the house and it would get close to sunset and everybody'd say, okay, out to the field. The whole crew would go down there, set up the dolly track, you know, set up the lighting, they'd get the camera set up and sort of wait for just as the sun went down and they'd say, okay, rolling. They'd say, you know, action. I'd be like, is this heaven? Okay, let's do it again. Is this okay. heaven? Okay, that's all we have time for. And we'd be done. And then the next day, <laughs> We'd come back and right around sunset, down we'd rush, and then there'd be Kevin. No, it's Iowa. No, it's Iowa. Okay, that's it. You know, so we ended up shooting this scene almost a line at a time over the two weeks that that I was there in Iowa, which if any of you have ever done acting, it's hard enough to get kind of emotional and hold that place once for a good take, let alone time day after day after day after day. So Needless to say, it was a it was a challenging scene, and with my recent, you know, grief over my dad, it made it all the more difficult. But what, what was kind of neat was that as we started doing the scene, I think everybody in the crew, and there's you know maybe seventy or eighty people, you know, around a movie set. I think they were all kind of thinking of their dads, and in their own way, kind of bringing their own fathers to to our this little baseball field carved out in the middle of the cornfield, and. If you haven't been there, it is in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's way out there. But it would get quieter and quieter each day as we shot this scene because everybody was kind of like, you know, having their own little moment with their fathers, I think, while we were shooting it. And, you know, by the end of the two weeks and we all we had left to shoot was the actual catch, okay. uh, you know, when the helicopter is, you know, they left that, they left that uh, shot for last because, you know, it was the biggest thing in the movie and, you know, more expensive than any other frame of that that we shot. Uh, you know, we, we were ready to go. And then, of course, uh, there's a I, I wrote a book because there's so many interesting details about this. But in that scene, of course, there's a helicopter and it's the thing. And it's again, they have to match the light. We've been shooting at magic hour. So it's got to be light enough to match that. But at the same time, it has to be dark enough that you can see the headlights of the cars going on for three miles. Those are real people in real cars. This is back before CGI. They were yeah. all listening on their AM radio to Phil Robinson, the director, who's broadcasting like, start your engines. OK, everybody, we're rolling. Start to creep forward in your car. You know, it was a huge, huge deal that 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 this shot was even going to get made at all. We thought we had one take at it. Well. Anyway, uh, you know, once the helicopter starts roaring up, you can't hear anything. We don't have a radio because everything is in the shot. Uh, off they go. And I'm thinking like, oh, my God, what if I drop the ball? Like, what if Kevin throws me this and just for whatever, you know, I got this vintage catcher's net that was like a brick in my hand. It was, and you know, it's just such a funny thing. You know, I played catch with my brother like a billion times in our backyard. But I thought, here's this moment where the father, the minor league baseball player has finally arrived and Boom. You know, I was thinking, oh, I'd look like an idiot. So anyway, there was added stress. But uh, despite all that and the fact that the first couple takes of it got ruined, uh, the movie obviously turned out well. But it was a very stressful shoot. And, uh, and, and you know, poor Phil Robinson, the director, uh, you know, nearly had a nervous breakdown with all the things that were going wrong. Yeah, I'm not an actor, but knowing, you know, uh, from being a fan of movie reading, I knew, you know, I think we're we're spoiled as as viewers of movies, whether it be in the theater or home. I think we're spoiled, you know, because we 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 see the movie, we think, oh, that was done in the time we're watching it, like it's all yeah, real exactly. time. Uh, where you said that that scene, uh, you know, two weeks, and uh, you know, it's hard to get in any rhythm, like you said, you're you're trying to deliver the line, and then okay. 
our time's up for today. You're like, you, you can't, it's hard to get, you don't have to be an actor to know it's hard to uh, get in any kind of rhythm under those circumstances. And you got to keep doing that. Um, you know, one of the questions I do have on my list, kind of a funny question. Uh, you talked about the catch uh, with, with Kevin. Con was that one, was that done in one day or did you have to do that numerous times? Uh, well, like I said, we thought we had one take at it because of the lighting situation. If it got too dark, then it, it, it wouldn't have worked. Well, we did the whole thing and, you know, the cars moved and all that stuff. And this was before they had kind of playback where you could actually take a look at it and see if it worked. This was, you know, so you were kind of going blind and it, the light seemed OK. So they said, hey, let's do this again. You know, here's this, you know, there's a, cam a, a camera operator named Davy Jones who's hanging out the side of this helicopter while they're, you know, yeah. there was just so many moving parts to that. So we do another take and it still kind of looks, it just, it just doesn't kind of look good to, to everybody. So they decided to one last take. And so, so they do the take and then it's just, you know, they're not going to find out until they go process the film and a week later. So they're Phil, Phil Robinson, the director told me this after the movie, I had no idea as the actor, but when I was researching my book, I, I, I found out that, so they look at the first take and when the camera pans up from the field to the line of cars, it goes to black. It's just black. There's nothing oh. there. And they're like, what happened? What could have possibly happened? So they quick, let's go see second take, second take pan up, same thing, black. And they're like, Oh my gosh. I mean, this is a shot that they can't replicate. They can't do over. Yeah. And they go to the third take and, uh, because it hadn't looked great, Phil had told everybody in, in through the AM radio in their cars to flash their lights on and off. Because what was happening is because there were so many cars, they couldn't move anymore because they'd already started down the driveway to do the second take. He couldn't back up 3000 cars. So they weren't really moving. But somebody had the idea to flash the lights. And so anyway, the third take comes up and there they are. And because people are flashing their lights, it gives the illusion that they're moving that they're moving behind trees or whatever so that the, you know, the, the headlights are blocked for a second. Anyway, that was the give and take, uh, you know, that, that we ended up seeing from the movie. And it turns out what happened is, so I told you, Davy Jones is hanging out here with his, with his camera, his camera assistant, when, when they pan up from the bright field to the dark sky, he had to open the iris of the camera and in all the confusion, I mean, falling out of the helicopter, your life at stake, <laughs> he, he closed the iris instead of opening it for the first two takes. And so that's yeah. why it went to black and that those and that those takes were were useless. But in, in the final one, he opened it. Yeah. And, you know, but those kind of both difficult and magical things happened over and over with that movie. Uh, you know, the uh, you know, as, as many people know, it was a drought in 88 when we shot the movie. The corn wouldn't grow. So they're shooting every other scene of the movie just waiting for the corn and there's no rain. You know, the corn is this tall and how stupid it would be for the players to be walking and, you know, <laughs> ankle high corn well they got special permission to to water the corn which you know farmers don't do in iowa they just know sooner or later the rain will come but we had to shoot you know yeah so they got they did that they also ordered forty thousand fake silk stalks of corn from hong kong that were on hold that they were going to have to shove into the ground and we'd be walking out of this you know artificial corn field uh, anyway uh, so they get everything else shot. It's blazing hot. It's this terrible drought. Anyway, finally, they can start shooting some of the corn stuff, which is, you know, if you watch that movie, there's corn in a lot of shots. So uh, anyway, when they got it there, Kevin's supposed to be inspecting the corn from early on in the movie. You can see it. Well, the corn at this point is now seven feet tall because with the water and the heat, it's growing like crazy. So you can't even see Kevin walking through it. So they had to build a platform between the rows of corn so that Kevin could be walking along the corn and looking like it's, you know, this high, he can be expecting it. And anyway, so if Kevin had taken one extra step, he would have disappeared into the abyss. Of corn. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, none of those things happen. And when you watch the movie, like you said, it looks perfect. Like, oh, my gosh, you guys must have had so much fun. And this is so easy. <laughs> and, oh, it was really one of the most cursed shoots I've ever been on. And, and of course it's one of the, you know, the best movies I've been involved with. So, so I got to ask you with the catch scene with, with you and Kevin, so no wild throws, no drop balls that, that all came out. Uh, scene yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was just such a funny thought that, that I had, you know, with the people risking their life, I'm thinking, what if I drop the ball? You know, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I played baseball. I'd be like, 
Like this is the last time. This is the the worst time if I'm ever gonna make a bad throw. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Catch. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But uh, it, it it all worked out. You mentioned you know the third take. What I mean, what do you know? What uh, Phil Robinson, the director, would have done had let's say the third take was the same as the first two. Right. I mean, what what do you think? I mean, would have I done? imagine they would have had to come up with. Uh, I mean, I think what's fortunate is such a dark scene. Maybe they would have, I mean, because CGI hadn't been invented yet. They might have yeah. created a miniature with tiny little twinkle lights or something to, yeah. to, to something make it work. That... But I, yeah, I really don't know. I, I, sh I should have asked him that if he had, if his mind was reeling. He's a, he's a very smart guy, but thank goodness it didn't come to that. Yep. And that scene, uh, and I'm not just saying this, uh, this is, is from the heart. That scene, I mean, the movie is, is very good, but that scene makes the movie great. To me, that scene uh, is what, uh, you know, it comes again, obviously, at, at the end of the movie. And it really, I don't want to say set the tone, because tone is kind of set earlier, but it, it's what the movie really default becomes about. When, you know, when people leave that theater, most of, a lot of people... Uh, with tears streaming down my, their face, myself uh, included, even to this day. It doesn't matter how many times I watch that scene. I know what you're going to say. I know what Kevin Costner is going to say. And it still gets me like every single time that, that, you know, that made uh, just a, a really good movie, uh, a great movie. And, and in a way you've become, you know, sort of a, a father figure to millions of people. I mean, with, you know, with that scene, I mean, have you, does that have you ever think about it uh, along those lines? Like you realize like the significance of, of, of that? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. First of all, I would add that I, I get emotional watching that scene, you know, and I'm in it, you know, so I know that it's yeah. something beyond, you know, my participation or anything. They really captured something, you know, fathers and sons or second chances. It, it, it really amazes me every time I, I still go to screenings. I've seen the movie, you know, so many times and it's still, it's still, I tear up, you know, um, uh, what was your question? Well, it just, I mean, the scene itself, like I said, makes the movie oh. and, but, uh, I mean, in a way you've, you know, yeah. you're, you're sort of representative of millions of people's dads. Yeah. Like, I've, women. I've had that experience. I, you know, I, I get, I got recognized, you know, for, for decades and it always surprised me because, you know, I, I don't think I looked, that much like I did, but I think because that scene's so emotional and the people who are invested in it, you know, my, my face is 40 feet high tattooed on their optic nerve or something. But, uh, yeah, I've had the most profound encounters with strangers in airports and grocery stores who, you know, once they recognize me from the movie, they feel compelled to tell me, you know, about their dad or about their, you know, relationship with baseball or these amazing things that happened to them that, it feels like they've never told anybody in their life. And, and here I am, this stranger, this actor who, you know, decades ago was in this movie. And I try to be very present for people because, you know, having lost my dad the way I did so close to that movie, it feels to me, each one of these encounters feels like my opportunity to kind of get a chance to, to touch my dad again, you know, through, through somebody else, else's relationship with their dad. And so to me there, it, it, it's very profound and, and, and somewhat, you know, sacred for me. I, I, I sometimes think of myself as a, as a traveling priest hearing these confessions that, you know, I, like I said, I, I swear sometimes I feel like I'm being told something for the first time by somebody who was too afraid to unburden themselves to, to somebody else. And, um, you know, I frequently end up, you know, embracing, hugging these people and, you know, telling them, you know, whatever I can, I, I, I try to be, I try to channel John Kinsella for a few moments and, and be that father that you always wanted, who maybe, you know, has the freedom to tell you, my gosh, I'm so proud of you, you know, whereas your, your dad is always thinking, I don't want to give him too much praise, or he'll go off the rails. And, you know, all those kind of things that, you know, I know, as a father myself, you, you have to kind of couch your, your, all your feelings, you know, I, I certainly, you know, tell my kids, I love them all the time, which is something, you know, my dad never was, able to say to me, I, I, I certainly know he did love me, but, uh, but you know, I, it, it's a, it's a fascinating predicament, a wonderful predicament I find myself in, you know, when I, when I talk to people, because, uh, 
I think it means so much to them and, and, and I try, uh, you know, it means so much to me. So it, it's, it's really rewarding and, and all this out of a, an acting career in a, in a six minute role in a movie, you know, 34 years ago. So anyway, well, you can, you can put whatever time you want on it. Dwyer, six minutes, 30 minutes, that six minutes is, is, uh, there's a lot of actors that wish they had those kind of, of six minutes, uh, on their resume. Uh, they may have more minutes, you know, on the res, but those kind of minutes where they they you know touch people uh, on that level. We're we're not even talking just some you know you know a parent or a loved one passing away. But I've even heard people say that scene, their you know their dad or someone in their family still alive. They're just estranged. They haven't talked to them in years. They you know they had a, an argument or falling out. But it was that scene that you know made them reconsider. Like. Hey, I'm gonna pick up the phone. I'm gonna be the first one to yeah. sort of, you know, bear, you know, bury the hatchet and try to uh, reach out and, and fix this. And uh, yeah. so it's not even just uh, uh, in 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 someone passing, but uh, even even you know relationships still that can be you know uh, uh, amended and fixed and and uh, you know repaired. And so even even on that level to have that sort of effect is is just uh, i mean you can't put that in words i'm sure it's, it's yeah I, I i've had hundreds of i've heard hundreds of stories and you know similar but also very different and and you know i've been uh just very touched by it i i put i think nine or ten of them in the book because they were they're just all so profound to me and 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 meaningful that um yeah i i i and it, it was my way of you know to me i think of the book is sort of having a catch with people you know, people love that movie and want to hear the story. So I throw them some stories and then frequently I'll run into them somewhere or on email or on book reviews. They throw the ball back to me. Oh, my dad was a fireman and, you know, or, you know, minor league baseball player. Anyway, it's this kind of great thing where when you share something that emotional, it, it frequently prompts other people to, to share back. And it's, it's very much like a game of catch, I think. Yeah. I saw, I saw two comments on a, on a message board that, that kind of struck me as kind of funny, uh, but uh, ring true. You know, one, I saw the movie when I was 17. I went with a couple of my baseball teammates fr from high school. Uh, I think I think there was three of us. I, I know I cried, and I believe uh, one of the other, uh, my friends, w was tearing. Uh, I think one was trying to fight him back. But I read, I read something on a message board where uh, a, a person said they were 17, uh, as well, they went to see the movie. They took, they went with their girlfriend uh, at the time, and they, you know, were bawling like a little baby. And the girlfriend uh, made front made fun of them and didn't, you know, get the significance. And the, the funny comment was, uh, uh, "She wasn't my girlfriend for, for much longer uh, yeah. after that." And he's like, "I'm married, but uh, that was my test. That you know, she yeah. sort of wasn't the she wasn't the one that that movie well, kind of interestingly we the other. The other end of that spectrum that I've heard is how many people uh, had their first date with their wife at Field of Dreams, and then they ended up getting married. And I think it's because, you know, women, if they when they see you cry like that, it, it shows another side of you that yeah. you know might never come out, you know, and it it makes you a kind of a more, uh, you know, full rounded person. And and so I think it's it's kind of interesting that both ends of that spectrum, you know, if if you can make fun of that moment, then then you're not the kind of person who sees the ghost players. You know what I mean? That's the way I yeah. always think. You're sort of like Mark, uh, uh, the the brother-in-law who can't see the yeah. face. He walks right through the field because he can't see it. You know, but yeah. if you do have that magic, uh, you know, you can you can see the players and you can also feel the you know the very delicate emotions that 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 movie uh, invokes. And the uh, the other comment um, I wanted to, to mention, um, I thought, John, yeah, can I, stop yeah. I have a yeah. guy who got a bulldozer in my backyard. I don't know if okay. you can, but if a little it does, bit, let me know, and I I don't know if, where I can move to, but I'd give it a try. Should I do that? No, you're good. We'll 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 get through it. We'll get through it. Okay, sorry, so, sorry to interrupt. Little little background noise, but uh, I I can edit a little bit of that out too. So, okay. but the, the other comment too, I want from from that message board. And I thought it was kind of funny is uh, the, the poster said, like, you know, to become like a naturalized citizen, you got to take the test. They said it should the scene itself should be on the test where if they don't cry after seeing it, 
uh, you know, then they they can't be they can't be allowed to be a, a well, citizen. I thought that was kind of that was kind of funny too. Yeah, there, there's been some fantastic comments. When you think how often Field of Dreams is, is, is it's so ubiquitous in our society, you know, if you build it and and is this heaven and yeah. all those things, it, it really is remarkable that that movie, you know, gave birth to all that sort of uh, that sentiment and those you know fantastic little catchphrases that that are everywhere. Yeah, it's in, it's incredible. Uh, you know, I've seen it I, I too many times to count. Uh, I'm a Godfather fan. I, I'd say Godfather and Field of Dreams uh, are my two movies. And if I'm if I'm changing channels and I run into, frankly, either one of those movies, uh, even though I've seen them both uh, millions of times or so it seems, uh, I stop and uh, my my channel surfing's done. And uh, no matter where apart, no matter what part of the movie. Uh, I, I come in on whether it's the beginning, the middle, or or towards the end. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna watch it, and uh, uh, it just uh, and again, like I said, I'm not every time. It does not it does not matter. And I know my dad; it, it gets him the same way. And he's you know uh, in his 80s, and uh, it just it 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 just a, a a classic movie. I think you know I'll say this, and and this is not lip service why i mean when you think of you know classic and great movie scenes when you know this has to be right up there at least in my mind on my list it's 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 right there as one of the greatest movie scenes you know not just from a great movie but the scene itself i mean uh, again did you did you you know did you know even i know you did it like you said over the course of two weeks and then even the final but did even in that process, did you realize how important a scene would be to the movie? Did you? Uh, I, you know? I really, really didn't, and I, I'm kind of surprised that I didn't. But the, the only defense I have, because you know, I obviously I read the script, but in the book that that the movie's based on, called Shoeless Joe, um, by W. P. Kinsella, the father appears in the first chapter, and and Ray sort of has a conversation with him throughout the whole book, and one of the great things that one of the great alterations that Phil Robinson made from the novella to the screenplay was that he put the appearance of the father at the end. And because I was so familiar with the book and I'd only had the script for a bit, I just really didn't understand how profound that moment would be. The other thing I couldn't take into consideration while we were shooting it was James Horner, beautiful score that, that, you know, got nominated for an Oscar and it, it's, it's a, it's a score I hear so much now. I feel like he wrote this thing that the people have, you know, tried to sample or, or, you know, steal from over the years. But that score, I think, also sort of makes the momentum of the movie like a storm coming across the prairie. And so then when my face appears, it has this weight to it that I, I couldn't have anticipated when we were shooting the movie or, or even reading the script. So uh, to me, those two things, uh, you know, obviously I, I benefited greatly from from the advantage of, of having, you know, that great, you know, and, and as a side note, uh, you know, Jamie Horner, who, who passed uh, unfortunately from a plane crash, uh, you know, probably five or six years ago, he, he had a difficult relationship with his dad too. And, and to me, again, I think when everybody on the cast and crew was bringing their own father and son relationship and mother and daughter, and that it contributed to the, profundity of of that and the universality of, of that father-son kind of conflict and and you know that Oedipal conflict you know we all have where you're trying to become a man and, and and you know your dad is the is the person who's you know your role model and you have to come to grips with that in some way or another you know by by you know outdoing him or or you know all those things that that as men we we deal with and and, and uh, you know it, it affects our lives so yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the score too. I mean, it was perfectly set. You know, it's funny when I watched it even this morning. Like, again, you, I think sometimes you hear it so much, you, 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 it almost kind of fades into the background. But for whatever reason, when I watched the today, you know, I realized, man, that the, the music itself was just perfectly set. Like, even almost if you took the dialogue out, it still hits you in a a, a, a sort of way. I mean, obviously the dialogue makes the scene what it is but uh just the, both of those elements together the, the score uh your guys's dialogue 
both that really just that's why I believe it's one of the greatest scenes in in, in movie history. Just well, one of the great so things. Well one of the great things that MLB did when uh, at the game this year was, uh, you know, they had the maze cut through the corn, which was fantastic, but they had speakers hidden in the corn playing the track, you know, from, yeah. from the movie, which just, you know, they're, they're just so evocative, you know, it just puts you in that feeling of nostalgia and, 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 and in the, in the world of the movie. And, and I think it really contributed to how magical that game was. Yeah, I, I I think I had goosebumps watching in in my living room just when you 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 hear that and uh, just uh, just an, an incredible movie, incredible scene, incredible performance uh, uh, by all the actors, but especially you with, with that scene, uh, you know, and uh, will live on, uh, you know, for generations even to 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 come. And uh, uh, for me to get to talk to you, you know, Dwyer, this is. Uh, uh, a huge honor, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, thank you for making uh, a, a tremendous movie. One that uh, you know, my son loves it. You know, it's just it's one of those that gets just passed yeah. down uh, to ge uh, generation, like the game itself. You know, it, the movie has become sort of uh, you know synonymous with the uh, the game of of baseball. Not even just the game of baseball, but but life life in general. And, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, it's just yeah. even the father son thing, of course, is is universal. Everybody's got a father, whether they were there for them or you know, or, or yeah. whatever. It it really uh, it it really kind of captures that that very complex and sometimes difficult relationship. Yeah, well, I, I thank you. I know you're a busy guy. Like you said, you're 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 about to head off to to get that project uh, in in Iowa underway. That should be uh, very cool. I look forward to uh, following you. Uh, on social media and keeping abreast uh, as that thing uh, grows and uh, becomes what it's going to be. Uh, I, I appreciate you giving uh, us, me, and, and the show some time. I'm sure many people listen to the show. It'll, it'll you know, I, I know it rings true uh, for them as well. I always give our guests the last word, websites, books, where people can get the book, where people can check out uh, what you're doing, where you're going to be. Uh, take your time as, as much as you need. Give out all that information for those listening. Uh, well, thank you, John. Uh, uh, the book I mentioned is uh, is called If You Build It. Uh, it's available on Amazon or on my website, and all my social media is just uh, at Dwyer Brown, D-W-I-E-R Brown. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the building we're working on, we're calling it the baseball building because it was, you know, built in 1860 when baseball and and it's uh, you know that that uh, there's a website and and the baseball hall of dreams is is the name of our thing. So anyway, I hope I'll see you. I'm going to be back in Syracuse, and and uh, I hope uh, you know some of you come out to the ballpark and we'll we'll have some fun. Here's here's the crazy here's the crazy thing, Dwyer. I checked the date. Uh, you're you're here July 30th, and I'm I'm really disappointed. Not your fault. Um, I'm at a national convention for sports cards uh, that week. That's in Atlantic City. Oh, my so, oh, wow. yeah, but uh, I, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you. We'll, we'll meet somewhere, uh, you know, I, 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 even if I have to do a little traveling myself, uh, we'll, we'll get it done. But just bad, bad timing there. I had no, when I looked at the day, and I, I actually, I only live about two miles from, from uh, NBT Bank State uh, Stadium here in Syracuse. It's just, I'll be, I'll be out of, I'll be in New Jersey uh, when you're here. Otherwise, other than that, I'd be there with bells on and, and would have looked forward. But like I said, well, uh, if I have to travel a little bit, so be it. But uh, uh, I look forward to hopefully meeting you in person as, as well. well. Maybe, play, maybe play a catch. Yeah, when we find that, then I'll just have to say, hey, John, you want to have a catch? <laughs> and I'll definitely say yes. <laughs> awesome, awesome stuff. Thanks, Dwyer. I can't thank you oh. enough. Uh, I'll, I'll put, uh, for those listening, uh, I'll put all the, you know, Dwyer's website uh, where you can find all that info in our show notes. So if you don't catch it when he said it, just look there. Either way, you know where to go. So thanks again. Thank you, John.